is democracy like clean air, water, good health, things that we don't really appreciate unless we don't have them? Sometimes I think so. In 2001, I was in Kosovo. It was at the end of a brutal civil war, and Serbia had just separated, or Kosovo had just separated from Serbia. And Kosovo was having their very first elections ever, and my job was to help monitor those elections. I was out there, and I was sent to a very small village way out in the countryside. And the voting that day was taking place in a one-room schoolhouse. It was set up like this. All the desks were cleared out except for one that was right in the middle. And that's where they had the ballot box. And it was a clear plastic container about the size of a laundry basket. It was sitting right there. It had a clear plastic lid with a slit for the ballots. Along this side of the room were the observers. And I was there with other people, other belligerents from the war, a Serb, Bosniak, Croat, I think a Roma was there. We were there to observe the elections that day. At the front of the classroom, they had rigged up the, the voting booth. And this was something that they made from a shower curtain that was strung from a pipe along the top of the ceiling. And all day long, villagers were coming in. They'd come in here. They'd get their ballot from the table in front of us. They'd go to the voting booth, shut the shower curtain, fill out their ballot, and then walk to the center of the room and cast their ballot. It was getting later in the afternoon. Things were slowing down. And I remember this old man walks in. And he stops in the doorway, and I see him clearly in my head. He had a black cape, a white wool hat, and he had a walking stick like this, and he had clearly been walking a long way to get there. And he walks up to the table where we were, gets his ballot. He takes a stick, goes, and goes to the front where the voting booth was, draws the shower curtain around him. And he's in there for a long time, and all the observers are getting a little antsy, but eventually he comes out, and he makes his way to the ballot box in the center of the room. And he takes his ballot, finds the slit in the front, and, and drives it home. Then he takes his walking stick and puts it down, rests it against the desk. And with his right hand, he grabs the top right side of the box. And with his left hand, he grabs the top left side of the box. And he lifts the ballot box over his head. And you can imagine, all of the observers go crazy. I remember the Serb next to me jumps up, and he's screaming. Everybody's screaming. And this old man takes the box, and he kisses it, and then puts it back down on the desk in front of him. And all the people who had just been screaming and yelling were just frozen. And there was nothing they could do except just applaud. And I remember that man turned and looked at us, and we could see this one tear just coming down the side of his face. It was incredible, and it was so clear that that man appreciated the value of democracy. But how about the rest of us? If you look at a lot of current surveys, the answer is many of us don't, especially young people. A survey taken in Australia this time last year found that among Australians between the ages of 19 and 29, less than half said that democracy is the most preferable form of government. That was from the Lowy Institute, and that same survey found that among the same age group, 20% said it just doesn't matter what kind of government there is. And it's not just Australia. You could find surveys like that taken today in Western Europe, in the United States, and you see an unmistakable theme that there is a diminishing sense, especially among young people, that democracy is an essential form of government. And why is this? Now, I've got to believe that part of it is that World War II, the Cold War, and these other epic struggles for democracy are beginning to recede further and further into the past. I remember very clearly as a young boy growing up in Bethesda, Maryland, near Washington, D.C., that every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., that big green air raid siren behind Burning Tree Elementary School would go off like this. And all of us were, did what we were taught, which was to jump under our desks, because we were ready for that day that we knew would surely come when the Soviet Union would send their bombers and their intercontinental ballistic missiles to attack us. I tell that story to my children, and they look at me like a lot of you guys are looking at me right now, like I'm from another planet. But it, it is true. The idea that, of democracy, struggling for democracy, just seems a lot less existential 
now than it once did. And it, it makes you wonder, you know, do we have to wait, really, for another global conflict? Do we have to wait for the, an imminent nuclear attack to really appreciate democracy again? I don't think so. I really don't think so. And I think it goes back to that same question I had in the beginning. Is democracy like clean air, water, good health? Yes, I think it is. Of course, if you don't have those things, you will appreciate them dearly. But you do not wait until you can't drink the water. You do not wait until you can't breathe the air to be mindful of these, essential, of these essentials of life. So then the question is, how do you become mindful of something like democracy? Well, one thing you can do is you can force people to be mindful of democracy. And that's something of what they do here in Australia with compulsory voting, where, where people have to go to vote or they pay a fine. And in talking to my Australian friends about that, most people here are, are OK with it. But, but then again, you still have those survey results that say 20% of young people that go and cast a vote still aren't convinced that what kind of government we have matters. And also, this is something, compulsory voting is something that I'm not sure readily transfers to other countries. And, and I could think about America as an American. I know if you tell Americans to do anything, that they have to do it, no way. There's no way. I've got a right. So they're not going to do it. So uh, another thing I see around me here in, in Australia is a, a sense that democracy is also kind of fun. And you have, you go vote, and you have a democracy sausage, and, and I love that. And I think maybe, maybe when all's, all's done, democracy sausages will end up being, you know, one of the greatest innovations of modern liberal democracy. But, but again, I think we have a problem here, and that I, now I can't speak for, for other countries, but, but as an American, I could say it's going to be hard to get Americans excited about eating hot dogs off of sandwich bread. So there, must ha there, has, to be, there has to be another answer. And I, I think there is. And it's simple. And it doesn't matter what country you're in. And that is simply to talk to each other. To talk to each other. And I'm not talking about conversations which already go on um, on, online or, or on cable news networks of conversations among people who already agree. You know, those echo chambers go on all the time and they just drive people apart. I'm talking about real life, in-person conversations among people who don't necessarily agree with each other. And the reason why I think that is so essential is that after 20 years of living, working, and traveling in many non-democratic countries, the common thread I see among all those countries is that people are afraid to talk to each other about anything controversial because it's just too risky. If you say the wrong thing to the wrong person, you could lose your job, you can go to jail, or worse. So those conversations just don't happen. And I believe it's incumbent upon all of us who are lucky enough to live in places where you can have those conversations to do it. And this is something that I've taken on as a personal mission of mine over the past three or four months, where about once a week, I go to a different neighborhood and find a different cafe, and I'm looking for people who don't look like me, talk like me, act like me, or think like me. We sit and have coffee. And what I'm trying to do is find out what the world looks like through their eyes. And we talk, and often it's very different from the way I see it. But over the course of the conversation, it really doesn't matter, because in that conversation, we all become more mindful of how lucky we are that we live in a society where we can have conversations like that. And I sincerely believe that if all of us resolve to initiate conversations like that, we can, coffee by coffee, increase our collective appreciation of democracy and celebrate how wonderful it is to have, to have government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Thank you.